Hi, I'm Sean Mooney, professor at the University of Washington and Chief Research Information Officer of UW Medicine. Over the past two years, we have been creating an initiative in medical data science, and as part of that, we have created this seminar. Speakers will include world-leading scientists who will tell us about how data can impact human health and their health care. Please use the link below to register for our mailing list to hear about future events in this series. We hope you enjoy them. Very exciting to introduce our speaker today, uh, Jayashree Kalpathy Kramer, um, who is currently uh, Division Chief of uh, Artificial Medical Intelligence in the Department of Ophthalmology at the University of uh, Colorado. Uh, she previously uh, had been at uh, Harvard Medical School in the radiology department. Uh, she's the author of over 200 uh, peer-reviewed uh, papers and, and dozen of book chapters. So uh, looking forward to hearing this uh, great talk. Well, thank you so much for uh, having me. How much time do I have? Sorry. OK, cool. Uh, just wanted to confirm that. Uh, excellent. And yes, uh, as was mentioned, I'm very excited I am at the University of Colorado now, uh, previously was at MGH uh, in radiology. Now I'm in ophthalmology. Uh, from my perspective, I think of myself as a data scientist, so somewhat agnostic to the domain. Uh, I've, we worked a lot in medical imaging across domains. And so I'm going to spend about the first half of today, uh, this session sort of talking about all the fun stuff and all the good things that we uh, were able to do over the last few years. And then the second half is something that uh, we don't see quite as often, which is all the ways in which things can go wrong. So it's um, sort of a mixed bag of how well, how some things work so well and how some things can be quite challenging, especially when we sort of start to move from a publication to something that is uh, going to be used in real life in the clinic. So. Uh, here are my disclosures. Uh, so yeah, so some applications of deep learning in medical imaging uh, for in from radiology, ophthalmology, and oncology. Uh, a lot of the technical challenges. I'm going to talk less about the technical challenges and uh, or rather more about the technical challenges and not as much about all of the uh, last mile challenges, including implementation, which would take many many days to cover. <laughs> Uh, practically speaking, and then some mitigation strategies and things to think about as, as again, we sort of go from the, oh, this works so beautifully to how do we work, get it to work in patient care for real. The first use case that I'm going to touch upon is uh, uh, screening mammography. Um, so this is a very common imaging modality. Uh, one of, and typically what happens when these mammograms are read is at least in the US, the reporting includes the breast density. Uh, breast density is categorized into one of four grades from fatty to extremely dense. One of the concerns um, and, and the reason for this is that both that uh, women with den dense breasts have a higher risk of breast cancer. Uh, also, the, the, the dense breasts make it so that uh, suspicious lesions can be harder to find. So again, reporting of breast density is a very commonly and much needed sort of uh, practice. There is a high variability among uh, radiologists, uh, as we see with many different things. Uh, we can see a lot of variability between clinicians in reading, and the likely, as was mentioned here, the likelihood of a mammogram as being read as dense varied quite quite substantially depending on the radiologist. Uh, breast density is a fairly easy kind of algorithm to train a deep learning network to do. Uh, and in some ways, it's a really good use case from a technical perspective of a, uh, of a lot of the challenges that we see, especially in terms of variability between scanner types, with, between um, the impact of interrater, uh, variability in terms of ground truth. So we've been using this breast density uh, data set as a good test case for a lot of our technical work. We were fortunate to have access to this very large uh, DEMAS trial uh, with 100,000 100, plus uh, images, and we've been using that for a lot of the work we did here. 
So one, this is again a work from a few years ago when we were sort of everyone was getting excited about what uh, deep learning networks can do. And so one of the first things we were sort of looking at is basically just looking at different network architectures, different training parameters, loss functions, the usual stuff when training a network and are able to show that we get relatively good performance in and in terms of the agreement of our algorithm with uh, ground truth was very similar to very comparable to the inter-rater agreement. So if you take any two radiologists in terms of their assessment of breast density, our algorithm was in the same sort of ballpark in terms of agreement. One thing that uh, we see that is kind of uh, interesting and again, not talked about as much is that even though the algorithm in aggregate uh, might look very different, very similar in terms of the performance such as Kappa or whatever the metric is, uh, being used to evaluate the algorithm, the on a per uh, image basis, the output can vary quite a bit. So it's in, it's really important to think about what these aggregate measures mean when you're evaluating algorithm performance and what it means on a on an individual basis. So here's an example of what the the top rows or the radiologist said. The different uh, approaches again, you see agreement in most of the cases, but you'll see some disagreement, especially in the boundary cases. And again, one of the first most important things that we found was uh, sampling strategies. Very often when we're talking about diseases, we have pretty low prevalence. And so when we train these models, we often use um, methods to try to balance the sampling, for instance. And that can greatly vary the performance of the algorithms for the low, the low prevalence classes. We then took this algorithm and did a uh, crowdsourcing uh, activity where we looked at the performance of the algorithm relative to a crowd of uh, readers and found that it sort of did quite well. Uh, the next, so uh, again, this is one of the things that we did very early on. We have an algorithm that some, seems to work quite well and we continue to use that to evaluate a variety of technical things that I'll talk about in a few minutes. The next thing that uh, I wanted to touch upon is COVID uh, and imaging and COVID. I think this happened with many, many groups is uh, starting in uh, early 2020 uh, as a pandemic sort of took hold pretty much a lot of people sort of pivot in the imaging AI world sort of pivoted to doing COVID related research and we were no different. Uh, and one of the, uh, one of our collaborators, one of the people working in a lab happened to be a resident who was deployed to the front line. So one of, he was really uh, sort of interested in solving practical problems that might help sort of downstream clinicians. So the, uh, again, uh, at least at our institution at that time, chest x-rays were used frequently, uh, CTs less frequently, but chest x-rays were the primary uh, initial assessment of the uh, involvement of the lungs in COVID patients in early 2020. The, the problem that he, as a, a frontline uh, sort of clinician and downstream, people who are taking care of these COVID patients were dealing with is that, that the radiology report would look very similar in all of these cases. It would say something like uh, multifocal patchy opacity, uh, but there was really very little quantification of how bad the disease was. So what he was really interested in trying to address is a quantitative measure of disease severity. So that in, in, in addition to just sort of saying, this looks like COVID, there might be some indication to the clinicians, uh, not the radiologists, but the, downs, the clinicians treating the patients as to who, how bad is the disease, who might decompensate, who's getting better, things like that. So, he, so that was the goal of this work. And essentially there's no uh, reproducible measure of severity. And it was really difficult to scale sort of a manual rating because there were so many different clinicians and a lot of inter and intra-rater variability. So uh, one of the things that we worked on is developing of an algorithm that can be used not just to say COVID positive or negative, but also measure the, um, uh, the severity in the chest x-rays. So in this particular case, we used a, a Siamese network type architecture and were able to show that the output of the uh, algorithm was pretty uh, concordant with a consensus panel of clinicians. Note that we use, for a lot of these things, we tend to use a consensus because using a single clinician can lead to quite a bit of bias in the uh, readings because there is um, some fair amount of uh, variability, at least for some of these uh, tasks between clinicians. 
So the output of our algorithm looks something like this. So we have fairly normal all the way to fairly severe involved. Uh, one of the things that was useful once we had this algorithm was the ability to then monitor all kinds of interesting questions that we had. Some colleagues had shown, at least in the early uh, part of the pandemic, that there was some substantial racial and ethnic disparities in the uh, severity at the time of first admission. And we've heard a lot over the pandemic about how the outcomes of, <coughs> of uh, especially people of color was quite different than potentially sort of white patients uh, across the country. And so what they, uh, they observed in this study, which is a manual non-AI based study, is that when, uh, when they assessed uh, disease severity, non-white patients that were hospitalized uh, were much more likely to have more severe disease on the admission than the white, or, uh, white patients. So we were able to then repeat the same thing with our measure of the, our AI-based algorithm uh, for the uh, assessment of chest, uh, chest x-rays. And we were able to then show not only at one time point, which is the same population that they had used, that on admission, if this is the non-whites, this was the whites, you can see that the proportion of se severe and moderate, which is the, the top two bins, was much uh, lower for the non, uh, sorry, much, uh, much larger for the non-white patients compared to the white patients. We also see as the pandemic wore on and April was when it was April 2021 it was particularly bad in, um, in the Boston area, we can see this sort of increase in severity uh, of the, uh, by, our, by our algorithm of the patients that were the non-white patients. So the ability to then use this AI algorithm that we developed but at scale, so we could do it not just on a few hundred patients, but we've been running this algorithm on every single patient that has been imaged uh, in the clinic uh, over essentially since 2020. And that allows us to do sort of all kinds of uh, things that go sort of from a patient level to a system level in terms of looking at um, trends of uh, not just the counts of patients coming in, but how severe their involvement is maybe helping with the uh, planning for uh, hospitalizations and utilization and things like that as well. Here is some work that a student did over, again, because we have been collecting data from, from the beginning of the pandemic, essentially through uh, the early part. It, it, we are ongoing, but this is work that he did earlier. You can see every wave. Uh, we can see the original wave. We can see the Delta. We can see sort of the Omicron. But what we'll notice is that the severity proportions have changed quite a bit. So even though the number of patients has, uh, you, you'll see these spikes at various times, the relative proportion of the severe versus the normal has changed quite a bit over the pandemic. And this is obviously modulated by the uh, vaccination status. So we, we definitely see the, uh, the impact of vaccination and the impact of uh, the different uh, variants as, as we go along in this chart. So on, from the, the uh, COVID perspective, what we ended up doing with our algorithm was the ability for diagnosis, but also quantification of the severity, prognosis, longitudinal monitoring. One of the things that, again, having a severity number allows us to do is better assess if somebody's getting better or worse. Uh, and that, again, has, uh, is very useful, especially for some of our hospitalized patients. And now uh, there's a lot of interest obviously in the long COVID and we are looking to see if there's any signals from the chest X-ray measurements in terms of things like long COVID. Beyond the per, sort of a patient level, we've also been looking at how the output of these algorithms might be used sort of at a, at a hospital level, at a uh, health disparities level. So going sort of from a local to a global scale. Uh, again, having a quantitative scale that allows us to a uh, quantitative measure that can be done across all patients over time really allows us to do these kind of more interesting uh, studies at scale. Now I'm going to switch uh, to ophthalmology. The other dis uh, one disease that we've been spending a lot of time uh, over the last decade plus working with Dr. Michael Chang, who is now the director of the NEI, is on a retinopathy of prematurity. It's a disease affecting low birth weight babies. Um, and it's one of the leading causes of preventable childhood blindness worldwide. There are uh, 
a number of, a very large number of babies, again, more so worldwide than in the US, that who, uh, who may go blind from this disease, but there's a wide range of treatment options available if diagnosed early. So we've been, again, seeing if uh, our image analysis algorithms can be used to help in this, uh, this problem. This is a uh, large consortium. There's many sites that have been collecting the data, but on the AI side of things, there's a number of us working across, across the US uh, on this problem. So there's many ways on thinking about the uh, ROP uh, blindness prevention program. And what I'm really gonna be focused on is the second one, which is the, uh, the timely and accurate ROP screening. This, this particular disease is uh, modulated by the delivery of oxygen in the NICUs. And this is, uh, again, less of a problem in the US, much more of a problem uh, internationally in low and middle income countries where now with improved care, a lot more of the premature babies are surviving. Unfortunately, in some cases, in some hospitals, they don't have very good uh, monitoring systems for uh, oxygen delivery, and that can lead to poor outcomes in terms of their, uh, for, in terms of blindness. The way this disease is uh, measured and um, um, diagnosed is by looking at the vasculature of the, uh, the eyes, uh, looking at fundus photographs. On the left, you'll see a normal image where you can see that the vessels are relatively straight and not very uh, dilated. As you go from left to right, you'll see that there's a lot more tortuosity of the vessels. Uh, and then you can also start to see that the vessels get uh, dilated. So this is the international system that's being that's used for diagnosis of the disease, which is, uh, they call it normal pre plus and plus. So uh, back in 2018, actually we started the work in 2016, but in 2018, we developed an algorithm for the diagnosis of uh, AURC. The algorithm sort of was developed using this uh, data from this large consortium and I funded over many years and we were able to develop an algorithm for the uh, prediction of ROP. The way the ground truth was uh, developed for this algorithm is having a multiple experts, all of them look at the, uh, the disease and say whether it's plus or not, actually the three levels uh, classification. And we are able to create, again, the algorithm that has very high performance. The thing you'll note uh, on looking at the ROC curve is that if you plot the performance of uh, individual readers on that curve, you'll see quite a bit of variability in terms of where they lie. So some people are more uh, sensitive and some people are more specific as you can see on, uh, on their performance on this ROC curve. If you also look at their inter-rater agreement between uh, any pair of raters using quadratic weight kappa, you'll see that there's, again, quite a bit of variability between uh, pairs of raters. On the other hand, the algorithm, uh, uh, as well as the consensus reading, sort of uh, agree pretty much more, uh, there's much more agreement with that. Uh, this was technology that is hopefully will be tran uh, translated and uh, deployed in the clinic. It received the, uh, from the, uh, the, the, it is going through the FDA process now, but it uh, received the breakthrough status at that point. And again, we are hoping to get this uh, through the FDA process and deploy it globally. So the questions that now that we have this algorithm was, can we use it to, for screening, diagnosis, risk prediction, and what are the potential advantages of doing so? So some of the, this is again, uh, slides from Dr. Campbell at OHSU, but this is work that we've been doing as part of the, uh, this NIH funded pro program for a number of years. So the diagnosis of ROP is subjective, uh, and we'll come to that in a minute, but this, if you ask, it, pairs of clinicians to look at the same images, you might get different answers. The exams can be quite stressful. Uh, so if you can reduce the number of exams that you need to do repeatedly, it might be extremely beneficial. The access to ROP screening, especially in low and middle income countries and rural areas is a huge issue. In many parts of the world, there's hardly uh, any pediatric ophthalmologists who can treat, diagnose and treat these babies. So if you're in a position to sort of take this algorithm and deploy it worldwide, I think we can make a huge difference in this preventable, uh, in this disease that leads to preventable blindness. And then uh, 
Another thing that it can be helpful for is if we are able to quantify disease severity, we might really try to understand how we can better sort of develop consensus and improve outcomes. One of the things that we noticed is that if you looked at the uh, sort of the two images on the top, you'll see that in some cases, uh, some people like on the, the image on the left, which is looks a little more concerning perhaps from the algorithm's perspective, the, uh, the uh, ophthalmologist decided to wait and watch, whereas so the one on the right, they chose to treat. So there's quite a bit of variability in terms of how individual clinicians are uh, might be treating these at different sort of cut points as which they choose to treat. And what we are hoping to do again is to see how by quantifying the severity, we might be able to better predict outcomes and provide some guidelines as to where it makes sense to treat versus wait and watch. Using that uh, algorithm, we also, using a similar algorithm, we've also created a um, severity scale, again, similar to the COVID case. What we have been really a fan of is creating severity scales as opposed to binary or categorical uh, outputs because this allows us to do a variety of things, including combining the score with other, other variables like birth weight and gestational age and other uh, covariates and predicting risk factors and so on. So what we showed is that this score, this uh, vascular severity score can be used to screen for ROP. Uh, again, we've looked at it both in the US as well as in India, in Mongolia, Nepal, in many different camera types and so on. Uh, showing that the algorithm has very high sensitivity and somewhat uh, very uh, specificity depending on, on where you are. This allows us to treat and track the patient over time. This allows us to then see who is getting worse, who's getting better, and uh, choose to treat depending on the not just a single time point, but the trajectory of the disease progression. What we also hope is that we can greatly uh, reduce the number of exams required. So in most cases, most of the babies do not progress to having severe disease. If we can identify early on those babies who are very unlikely to progress, perhaps they don't need such frequent uh, uh, follow-up visits, they don't need the stressful assessment, we can focus our resources, especially in resource-limited places, on those babies that are most likely to progress. The, uh, so again, we were able, we, some work that we did in terms of risk modeling showed us that we can predict with very, very high sensitivity, the babies that are uh, likely to require treatment. And this allows us to potentially have the, have the number of exams without missing a, a baby in three different populations. We've shown that we are able to do that. So uh, hopefully as we, as this gets matured and deployed, we can show that we can not only diagnose, uh, but also predict uh, pretty early on in the disease course, which babies are most likely to progress and also prevent uh, over treatment and over uh, utilization of resources by identifying those babies that are unlikely to need uh, follow-up care or at least unlikely to need treatment. So what we hope is that it can uh, improve efficiency, objectivity, accuracy, and reduce the number of exams required, especially in low and middle income countries. Another thing similar to the COVID uh, work that we did is that using this AI score, we're actually able to look at differences in uh, hospitals. So a, a sort of a measure from a more epidemiological perspective of how uh, different hospital systems are performing. And what we were looking at is, this is again work uh, done with uh, Pete Campbell and others in the Arvindai system in Southern India. We were showing that if you look at the uh, vascular severity score for the, uh, given the birth weight and gestational age, there are certain outlier hospitals. And we, using that, we were able to identify those outlier hospitals where, the, uh, where there's much more disease despite having a much lower risk population based on demographics. So the question is, so this was information that was fed back to the hospital. They looked at their mixers and other oxygen delivery systems and were able to sort of improve that. And hopefully going back, we'll see the, reduct, the, uh, the impact of that on reducing the rate of ROP in those hospitals. 
The third uh, uh, sort of area is cervical cancer screening. This is work with the NCI, um, again, meant at a global population. So it's a leading course of uh, cancer morbidity and mortality world, worldwide. Uh, HPV infection is again, the strongest risk factor. And typically in many of these, um, uh, the many of these countries, the way we uh, diagnose is by the application of acetic acid and visual inspection. Our hope is that by using uh, machine learning in conjunction to HPV testing and typing, we can use uh, uh, a, as part of a, a comprehensive cervical cancer screening pro uh, program, we can identify the women most at, at risk of uh, cancer. So this is called the PAVE study. There's a uh, multi-step, there's a HPV testing and typing. So the most uh, concerning HPV 16 and the other risk types uh, followed by a uh, automated, what they call AVE or automated visual examination with a uh, handheld mobile device uh, followed by treatment uh, almost immediately. This was work that had been done at NCI originally, uh, showing that they had extremely high performance of uh, MAUC of 0.91 and the ability of uh, to be able to diagnose uh, uh, so, so sort of pre-cancer and cancer from these, uh, these exams. So as I suspect everybody here is uh, facing, it gets, it's getting really, really easy these days to train uh, AI algorithms. Um, Chat GPT has made many of our lives a lot easier. Uh, I'm not sure if everyone here uses it for all their coding, but we certainly are starting to do a lot more of that. Uh, if you, between the ability to write your code and auto ML and the ability of Chat GPT to write your abstract in your papers and your grants for you, I think we, <laughs> we are in a place where uh, a lot of things are changing very, very quickly. But, but it is, we have high school students in a lab who are able to, sort of train these algorithms. So it's really with the tools that are there, it seems like it's getting very easy to write these AI algorithms today. Unfortunately, even though it's so easy to get sort of the first uh, algorithm that looks awesome on paper and great, great, great performance, we find it, it sort of continues to be difficult to create something that is safe to deploy, that's generalizable, that's broad, that's unbiased, that's self-aware and knows when it's wrong, or at least knows when it should be uh, not make a decision, well calibrated, sort of provide uncertainty, things like that. So, uh, so the next half of the talk, I'm going to talk a little bit about all of the challenges that we run up against. And interestingly, uh, we've seen the same sort of challenges across these different domains. Uh, and um, I'm going to list a bunch of seven, sort of seven of the main challenges that we run up against and how we are thinking about it. But I'm hoping that perhaps during the discussion time, I'd love to hear from everyone in terms of which of these things are things that you've seen yourself or how are you thinking about it or are we doing something wrong and you don't have these issues, things like that. So, so the challenges that we have run up against in, when we are going from a um, single... <laughs> A paper to something that is uh, really ready for deployment across the globe is this the notion of um, generalizability. So very often the models are brittle and do not generalize across populations, across scanners, across disease presentation. Uh, the model predictions are not repeatable. We were very surprised when we did a literature search to see that the um, there's very little work that actually looked into seeing how repeatable AI, especially deep, model, deep learning models are. Test, retest on a patient and things like that was not studied very much at all. Many, many diseases lie on a spectrum. Uh, both algorithms and clinicians tend to binarize or bend them. Uh, this uh, dichotomania, as uh, some people refer to it, can lead to many issues in, uh, in terms of how we have sort of different thresholds between normal and mild or mild and moderate and how uh, forcing those artificial boundaries can be challenging in terms of getting agreement between clinicians. Models are poorly calibrated sometimes. Uh, very often we have silent failures without 
uh, any indication so the models can be confidently wrong. Uh, there's this need for explainability and there's many opinions on how, how much of a need there is, whether we should ask our algorithms to be explainable. Uh, overfitting can be a huge issue and any time we've gone and done sort of literature searches in terms of uh, radiomics or AI models in general, what we see is a lot of overfitting. And models can be biased in very hard to detect ways. So going back to the ROP case, what we noticed is that we, most of the algorithm was trained using a population of Caucasian babies in the US. Uh, the eyes look very different in different populations. The pigmentation is different. The camera systems are different. So the field of view might be different. The uh, a variety of things can be different. Different protocols. We were expecting to see fundus photographs. Suddenly we saw these uh, uh, zoomed out versions of the eye. And in some ways for the algorithm, it, it almost looked like a fundus, but obviously it was not trained to expect these kind of images. And very often the algorithms don't have a filter to see whether we uh, are using the feeding into the input, the correct kind of algorithms. The quality is an issue. Uh, very often we need to have a quality assessment as a precursor to a classification algorithm. But often the quality and disease severity can be um, are, are related, they're not uncorrelated. In the sense, very often, for instance, sicker patients may have more motion uh, when they are in the scanner. The fundus photographs of a very severely uh, diseased patient might look different and have poor quality. So we need to think about how to assess quality in, in, the, uh, um, in the spectrum of disease. Biology can be different this, in the Indian population versus the US population. There might be different ways in which disease presents or the association between the usual risk factors and disease might be different. Going back to the cervical cancer scheme, uh, soon after the NIH uh, colleagues had written the original paper that showed phenomenal performance, they then had, was, when they were starting to deploy this and looking at different populations and other data sets, they ran up against a lot of challenges. And so this was a follow-up paper where they really sort of, uh, in addition to saying what worked well, they had this long list of um, things that one needs to think about when translating the algorithms into clinical practice. So the first problem that I want to touch upon is this notion of uh, brittleness. Uh, very few, it's getting a little better now, but very few of the deep learning models have been, have been text, uh, tested on completely independent external validation. And data heterogeneity can lead to poor model performance and external data sets. The distribution differences uh, can be from a variety of sources. So we might have different prevalence of disease at different institutions or different populations. We might have different scanner types. Uh, we also might see a lot of confounding. For instance, if you look at the association between breast size and breast density in the white patients compared to the black patients or African-American patients, you'll see it looks quite different. So, this, so we need to be careful about making sure that the algorithm works equally well in all subpopulations of interest. We had done some work in federated learning using breast density as a use case. And what, again, we noticed is that one institution did not use one of the categories at all. So most institutions use four categories, this one institution only used three categories. So if you, again, if you think about training an algorithm that was trained on institution one or two, and then try to apply it on institution three, it's gonna predict a lot of this missing class and you'll see a lot of discrepancy between what's the internal protocol and what the algorithm was trained on. The, uh, the data coming from different scanners can look quite different, or different uh, image acquisition systems can look quite different. So this was four different, uh, three different scanner types. You can look at the histogram of the intensities and see, appreciate right away that they look quite different. Uh, if you, on the uh, figure on the right, if you look at the diagonal elements, it's when you train and test a model on the same device, you get very good performance. But if you train a model on device one and then test it on device two, you, or three, you get really awful performance. So the, these models, again, can be quite brittle in that they work really well in the populations that they were trained on and really poorly on other populations. On the other hand, if you had access to all of the different uh, images from all the different scanners, you can see that the, the 
algorithm can uh, be, learn, be taught to work equally well on all different scanner types. The, uh, at the same time, our uh, MCI colleagues had run up against the same issue when they were doing the cervical cancer screening. They had data from two different uh, camera systems. And what they show again is the same behavior where you, when you train and test on one population or one camera type, you get great performance. The off diagonal elements, you can see that essentially random performance when you uh, trained on one and tested on different. So we saw the same thing in ROP as well. When we trained and tested on a North American population, for instance, which is a top row, you can see that the performance is really good. But then when you train on the North American population and test it on the Nepal population, you can see a substantial drop in sensitivity there. If you look at UMAPs or other kind of uh, low dimension representations of what these networks view the data as, you'll see sort of distinct cluster, clusters based on the population. And uh, this is something that we've seen consistently and that I'm curious to see if other people have noticed as well, which is that these networks seem to learn the scanner type first and then learn the disease of interest. So in the left, you can see the three different scanner types having each different clusters, but within each cluster, it's going uh, from the light purple to the dark purple. It's learned sort of the disease progression between or the, uh, the feature of interest between fatty to dense. In the right uh, figure, you see again, uh, the different COVID population, the different chest X-rays uh, look very different. The, the one cluster on the left is from uh, Brazil, but each sort of uh, scanner and population seems to be a different cluster for the network. What we had hoped initially was that the early layers and normalization would sort of um, disentangle all these features, but what we continue to see is that Despite our best efforts at normalization, uh, we, the network seemed to pick up on these things that are humanized, in, in fact, not as capable of seeing, which is potentially sub subtle texture differences or other things that cause the images from different acquisition devices to appear as different clusters. So in order for us to really sort of come up with a very generalizable uh, network approach, I think we still have a lot of work left in terms of approaches to training networks that's a little more agnostic to the device. And, and there's a lot of new methods coming online that I hope will address this. We also need good out of distance, uh, out of distribution distances and metrics that will tell you whether a network trained on a certain training population is likely to work on the data set of interest that you might be wanting to deploy the algorithm on. The other thing that, uh, again, we don't see very often deployed in real life is some uh, sort of guardrails on the input. Uh, if, you, if you give a network a picture of anything, it'll happily give you an output. Uh, but we don't know if it's really something you should be making a decision on. For instance, here's a cervix detector on the left. You can see that it happily found a cervix on the right. Uh, the scores were lower, but it still did find a cervix on the right. So. As we start to deploy these models in the clinic and in practice, we need to, we cannot assume that uh, the input is always going to be perfect. We know, for instance, the DICOM headers can be incorrect, uh, not infrequently. We know that it might be possible that uh, a pediatric X-ray came in instead of an adult or whatever uh, might, the model may not have expected to see such a, such an image. And we've seen that from sort of general scenes of uh, stop signs and other things where slight perturbations cause the algorithm to, the, the trained algorithm to not work as well. So uh, area that we're working on and don't have a solution for, but potentially increasing the data diversity, really focusing on multi-institutional data sets. Uh, there's certainly efforts in COVID such as Medric and others where uh, NIH is funding these large multi-institutional TCIA is another one, um, ADNI, so many other NIH funded efforts have brought together these uh, rich multi-institutional data sets, but we really sort of need to scale that up. Uh, and how do we do that is continues to be a challenge because uh, sharing patient data is not trivial. Personally, we've been excited about the potential of federated learning. So maybe we don't have to share the data. Maybe we can set up this 
a federated learning network where you can train from multi-institutional data sets without the need for data sharing. We also need better uh, AI methods to improve uh, generalization. We need better ways of detecting out of distribution, uh, especially metrics that where a distance of the out of distribution translates to a prediction of the performance that is reliable. And that is work that is happening uh, in the field, I think. Uh, in terms of evaluation plans, I think we need to think carefully about how this auto distribution might occur or ways in which the algorithm is brittle. So making sure we see the performance on different scanners, on different quality, on anatomy, uh, demographics, and so on. The second problem I want to touch upon is the repeatability of uh, deep learning predictions. I, Surprisingly to us, a, a replicate set of images do often yield different results. So this was the same woman uh, image twice in a very short amount of time. To our eyes, it looks relatively similar. In the left image, the model predicted as normal. In the right image, it said it was pre-cancer. And we see this, again, somewhat surprisingly, uh, but across domains. Uh, we, If you look at the prediction of the network in terms of uh, test retest we see this kind of a behavior where a lot of elements might be in the in the uh, top left or the bottom right but there's also these flips where in one case it's uh, it's predicted as cancer in the other case it's predicted as normal you sort of see the same thing with uh, knee x-rays again just flipping it from left to right we see the prediction score change quite a bit uh, very little published literature on this topic and from our experience, when we tested many, many of these networks, we don't see uh, we don't see as the level of repeatability that we'd expect to see if you're going to deploy it in real life. Uh, this is again from cervical cancer data. You can see the same kind of flipping. And if you plotted test retest, you see, especially in the middle, you see this um, off diagonal perform uh, perf uh, off diagonal behavior that you shouldn't see. This was from five different, four different use cases. So we looked at uh, ROP, we looked at knee osteoarthritis, we looked at cervical cancer. What we showed is if we use a uh, sort of Monte Carlo approaches or ensemble approaches, we get much better repeatability. Uh, and you can see that as in the lower uh, set of figures where the spread between test retest test scores is substantially lower when you use the Mon Monte Carlo approach, but there's, three class or five class, we again see great lead rule performance. So in terms of an evaluation plan, it, it would be great if we could have test retest test data sets. Uh, it's ideally of the same person acquired uh, slightly different conditions, uh, if it's ethical to do so. If not, at least artificially create these test retests, like flipping the image and rotating them slightly to see how robust the algorithms are to these small variations. The third problem that we were dealing with is that um, our real world is a continuous spectrum often, uh, not black and white, but shades of gray. And we don't treat it as such when we create many of these algorithms, which tend to be yes, no kind of things. In the top row, we looked at uh, data from ROP images. So we had eight different uh, raters uh, looking at the same set of images. So each row is a rater, each column is an image. The color code is how they uh, graded it on a three level scale. And as you can see, the top rater had a very few reds and a lot of greens. The bottom rater had mostly reds, on almost no greens. Uh, but the other thing you'll notice, it's, it's not just random, but it tends to be biased. So the, the sort of the boundary between the red and the yellow, uh, maybe like right here uh, for rater three, but like right here for rater eight. So, uh, and this, when you plot this on the uh, ROC curve, that plots sort of translates to different spots on the ROC curve. We see exactly the same behavior when we looked at COVID. Again, looking at COVID severity, asking the uh, raters on a uh, three level, four level scale to grade uh, mild, moderate, severe kind of scale. And we see similar sort of behavior. Uh, this is public data set, the COVID, one of the metric data sets from early on. If you, um, plotted the ratings of rate one versus rate two between uh, mild, moderate, so negative, mild, moderate, and severe, you see that it lies on one side of the diagonal. So uh, it's not just random noise, but a bias between sets of raters. 
So one way in which we've dealt with this is instead of changing the, instead of asking, is this mild or moderate? We ask them, is this image better or worse? Uh, and what we find is when we do that, we get much, much more agreement between uh, raters. So people are pretty good at saying, is this one better or is this one worse? They're very hard at saying, or, or consistently saying this is mild versus moderate. So go, what we have done is going from the pairwise comparison, we create a ranking order using something like the ELO or Bradley Terry approaches, which is um, essentially creating a, uh, a ranked order of the severity and using that to uh, fine tune the algorithms, for instance. Other approaches we've used are looking at Siamese networks and others, but in all cases, what we generally find is that a severity-based approach is more consistent in, a, in terms of agreement between raters compared to uh, either binary or categorical or ordinal classification. So it would be great, again, in terms of evaluating this and if for your algorithm to create data sets with multiple raters along the disease spectrum and evaluate these uh, models, especially in the edge cases, sort of on the, on the boundary between classes. The next uh, problem I want to touch upon is that models often fail silently. Very often we looked at model performance in aggregate and don't look at the long tail of uh, low performing cases. This is a segmentation algorithm for uh, on the left from a, a publication, on the right from our own internal data. And although the algorithm performance in aggregate might be like a dice of 0.85, there's still an, not an insignificant number of cases that have extremely poor performance. So the question is, is there something we can do without having ground truth to identify those cases that are most likely to be incorrect? Uh, and again, Monte Carlo type approaches can be potentially quite useful. If you look at the output of uh, the different uh, networks, what we are able to show is that the predicted dice and the true dice are somewhat correlated as you see in the bottom right, uh, using these approaches and we might potentially be able to identify without having ground truth, the cases that are most likely to be uh, poorly segmented or incorrect. And these uh, approaches might improve the model calibration. Uh, again, very infrequently do in the uh, uh, machine learning literature, do we see calibration curves in the machine learning for medical imaging literature, do we see calibration curve? And I think as reviewers, as uh, users, we really need to sort of insist on looking at the performance of uh, these, the calibration performance of these algorithms and make sure they're well calibrated. One thing that, uh, there's a recent publication actually that talked about that and showed that even though it may be calibrate, well calibrated in one population, if you apply it on a different population, you have to, again, reevaluate the calibration again. The, uh, yeah, so, uh, look, it's important to look at the silent failures and the confidently wrong cases and see if there's sort of any defining characteristics. The next uh, topic I want to touch upon is overfitting that we see quite frequently in the literature again. This is work that a student did very recently looking at radio mix literature and showing that, uh, this was actually just published, but showing that a lot of the publications have data leakage that leads to over-optimistic uh, uh, estimation of the performance. And that can happen in many different ways. It can happen during the normalization, the uh, splitting of the training test cases in terms of uh, a variety of steps where inadvertent data leakage leads to very optimistic results. And she sort of tabulated the kinds of mis mis uh, mistakes that happen so again, if you don't if you don't normalize your test set from your training set separately, but just do a batch normalization, or if you do feature selection in batch cases, or you do model selection using test cases, you sort of get oh, each of these mistakes can give you a boost in performance. Uh, and if you just sort of back them off, you get essentially random performance. So using um, simulated data, she was able to show the impact of all of these different steps. So some recommendations from what uh, from her work, basically uh, in terms of are you partitioning correctly? Is there a good hygiene in terms of separating the test data from uh, training data? Do we have? Um, are you testing for micro? Are you doing lots of uh, 
hypothesis testing and just picking the correct model out of ha after having tested many hundreds of them. Is there an external test set? Is there an internal test set? What are you reporting on? And so on. Um, the next problem is uh, the, this explainability question. Very often, neural networks are considered black boxes. People have tried a variety of different explainable post hoc explainability uh, methods, such as saliency maps. Uh, they're, in our opinions, and that of many others, somewhat fraught and should be used with a degree of caution. Uh, here are some examples of publications that basically say, don't stop, <laughs> don't, uh, don't explain these black box methods because they're really not meant to be, uh, me the, don't meant to be treated that way. Uh, so in our, some of our own work, we showed that if you looked at the ability of these saliency maps in terms of are they good localizers? How much do they vary with model randomization? Are they repeatable? Are they reproducible? Uh, we were, there's a lot of issues with them and we've sort of provide a framework for how one might evaluate these uh, saliency maps. Uh, in terms of solutions, maybe inherently better, more explainable methods might be better. So instead of just saying classification as to positive or negative, maybe we want to do detection approaches or segmentation, at least then it's easy to see uh, if the model was wrong right away. Uh, same thing with the uh, in cervical cancer, is there ways to do it in a way that's not uh, just, yeah, yes and no without knowing exactly where it is. Uh, the question of bias is something that is uh, is everywhere that we need to be concerned about. There's a lot of publications of late and a lot of concern about that as well. Uh, what is surprising with some of the work that I, I noticed that uh, Judy Kichaya is going to be a speaker, but one of the work that uh, her, she and many others did is the this notion of uh, the ability of algorithms to detect race, which is absolutely mind boggling. How can an algorithm looking at a chest X-ray know the self-reported race of a patient? Uh, so we sort of see the same thing in fundus photographs, which is not surprising because we expect the pigmentation to be a proxy, but we also see the same thing in things like this segmented vessel maps where we don't expect to have any information about uh, pigmentation. So there's a lot more information about self-reported race that seems to be hidden in the images in ways that human and humans are not able to appreciate. And so as we think about deploying these algorithms broadly, we need to be quite cognizant about the potential of these algorithms to uh, sort of encode race and use that in ways that is unexpected. Another concern is that a lot of the uh, data used to train these algorithms comes from a very small portion of the the US, let alone the world. And so we need to, again, think about improving the diversity of the data used to train these algorithms. There are efforts such as Metric that, again, uh, seek to create these uh, rich data sets with a lot more diversity, and hopefully they'll help us train algorithms that are uh, more generalizable to all populations. So in terms of evaluation plans, I think it's critical that we evaluate the model performance in all subpopulations of interest and look at the failure cases to better understand that. And sort of and see if shortcut learning is happening. Is it essentially learning race instead of the disease of interest, for instance? Uh, the many algorithms seem to have sort of superhuman capabilities. They can do things that humans cannot seem to do, such as uh, look at your cardiovascular risk from retinal photographs or uh, look at, again, looking at the eyes, predict all kinds of things. Uh, and yet they are potentially have the ability to learn things like uh, uh, self-reported race. So the, given the ability to have the su superhuman performance where a human cannot really check to see what it's doing, plus the risk of bias, really suggest that we need to be quite vigilant when we think about deploying these algorithms and make sure that we test their performance repeatedly in all the different populations of interest. So uh, final checklist uh, in terms of things that we have found useful before we do sort of broad scale model deployment. Uh, look, I think primarily, it's really, really important to look at the test retest performance of the algorithms. Does it, if you, if you image the same person twice, do you get the same answer? Uh, what is the re reproducibility of portability? If you have a slightly different device, does the algorithm still work? Do you have a way of uh, sort of looking at the inputs and making sure that, they, that the 
uh, input that you're trying to do inference on really is within the distribution that it was trained on and should be used? Or should you just say here, this is so different than what it's trained on, we shouldn't try to make uh, uh, an inference on. Look at model calibration. Uh, look at this notion of grave errors. Do you have a sort of uh, gray zone or an intermediate class? Or does the algorithm just say yes, no, and can it be confidently wrong and be wrong sort of in extreme? Uh, how do we assess image quality? Does the image actually have the in, in, enough information to be making a prediction or should, it, should we not make an a prediction on that particular uh, input image? Can the model be adapted locally? What is the continuous monitoring plan? So just a, a checklist of things that we found to be useful as we are uh, deploying it, whether it's in ophthalmology or radiology or oncology that uh, I would love to hear your thoughts on in terms of if you've run up against these things and how you thought about dealing with them. So. Uh, lots and lots of people to thank for various aspects of this. So uh, with that, I thank you for your attention.